let me introduce our first speaker here. Um, Dr. Colleen Suckling is an assistant professor in sustainable aquaculture at University of Rhode Island. Um, she received her PhD from the University of Cambridge over in the UK. As you, you'll hear if you haven't heard her speak already, you'll, you'll notice a, an accent of sorts. Um, she moved to uh, Rhode Island though in 2018 and um, is establishing a, a research program in microplastic extraction um, to investigate the impacts of plastics in the marine environment. Um, by training, she's an ecophysiologist uh, and interested in seeing how organisms respond to different environmental settings. And um, much of her research has been surrounding um, preserving the marine-based food system, um, but also ensuring economic and environmental sustainability. So because of that, her work kind of crosses across both to the fishing industry and academics. Um, so she's really got a great sort of interdisciplinary, cross-disciplinary approach to things. Um, a lot of her work in the past, especially has been revolved around uh, sea urchins. And so you can see her Twitter handle there, a kino nerd. Um, and, and Colleen, I gotta tell you, uh, you and I have a, a connection of sorts because um, uh, I, the Northern green sea urchin, Strongylus entrotus drobachiensis is near and dear to my heart because um, my senior thesis as an undergraduate uh, involved the biomechanics of urchin growth. And so I, I harvested and, 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 and reared and then sacrificed hundreds of sea urchins in the course of my senior, my senior year at, at, uh, at Bowdoin College up in Maine. So, um, so I, I always like to see a, a fellow echino nerd. So, um, well, welcome. And I will hand it over to you, Dr. Suckling. Thank you, Jim, for that very, uh, this fantastic introduction. I'm so happy that you're also an echino nerd. We should talk because we're, we're growing um, green sea urchins here in URI uh, as we speak. So I'd, I'd love to, to, to talk to you a bit more about the work you've been doing. Uh, and thank you to everyone joining us today. Um, you know, it's great to connect with such a great, enthusiastic and driven community of people here in Rhode Island. Um, I'm really happy to be here. It's such a great state and such a, uh, such a great place to study um, all sorts of things marine related. Um, and as Jim said, I moved over from the UK about three years ago now. So I still retained my English accent just about, I think, at this point. So if you have strange pronunciations coming from me, I apologize. It's, it's the uh, difference in pronunciations that we have in our different countries. And I'm always interested to learn how, about how to pronounce things properly uh, here in America. So anyway, thank you very much. And anyone who wants to ask me questions, um, please feel free to use the um, chat function. Um, or maybe um, I'm happy for you to interrupt in the talk to ask any questions. Uh, and also my email address is here on the screen. So if you want to reach out to me, that's fine. So I'm covering marine plastic pollution and I'm taking this in quite a broad kind of perspective here because I know some people have experience of this and some people may not have that much experience in this. And talking with um, Jim, um, the, the decision was to kind of make sure that I was gearing this towards our fantastic SEF students that we have this year. Um, so I felt that maybe um, some of you might appreciate a bit of an introduction to plastic pollution. So that's going to take a, uh, about a half of this talk, uh, just so that we've got some context of what it is and why do we care about it and what, what concerns us. Uh, and then the rest of the talk, I'll be talking a bit more about uh, recent and current research activities that are going and more importantly, student opportunities that are available um, in my lab. Uh, so uh, I'm wondering through the chat, can, pe can people who are doing surf projects um, identify themselves? I'd love to, uh, you know, maybe just say hi or just put a word down as to what topic you're looking at in your exciting surf projects. It's nice to, to sort of see what folks are up to. Because, uh, you know, you guys are, are wonderful and I'm hoping that you're all having fun and learning a lot um, in terms of what you've been doing so far. So have we got anyone in the surf um, projects here today? Jellyfish turning, that's exciting, nice. Uh, we've got someone looking at climate change and rockweed, fantastic. Okay, great. Uh, I mean, I'm interested in the jellyfish turning, I wonder what that entails. Uh, and we've got, oh yes, we've got Kelsey Wells here who was working with me, of course. Hi Kelsey, nice, I'm glad that you joined us today. Uh, and someone's looking at low oxygen and corals. So these are really exciting projects and these are all um, topics of interest and concern. Uh, so it sounds like you're, you're all being involved in really exciting um, and um, state-of-the-art kind of research, so that's great. And we've got more coming through. 
looking at um, microplastics and cyanobacteria as well. So this is great, this is exciting. Well, hi, and thanks for reaching out. And I hope you enjoy the your rest of your summers on these really cool topics. So I'm gonna ask you a question now. So this is a two-way process here. I want you to, to interact with me um, as best as we can in this Zoom tool that we're now very familiar with. Um, so the question here is, what are plastics? So can anyone type into the chat, what do we think plastics are? How would you, how would you describe them? And there's no wrong answers here. So how would you describe it to maybe uh, someone you were talking to in an elevator or uh, in a queue in a store? Synthetic material, excellent, yes, absolutely. Uh, so it's synthetic material, so it's stuff that humans have made uh, and it can be described as anything being as synthetic or semi-synthetic because sometimes we have synthetic combined with some natural materials, but that in turn makes it semi-synthetic. Um, so great, that's a, a great start there. So thank you from Michelle for that. Um, and one of the problems that we have here is that plastics are largely made from fossil fuels. So that we're kind of using oil from these fossil fuels to, to generate these um, plastics. And that's what makes them so cheap because oil is cheap to produce and easy to produce. It's a bi we're using byproducts in this process and we're making these very affordable plastics. So it's kind of contributing to the, the, the problem of climate change in a sense as well, in terms of its um, source to make this material. And, you know, we know that plastic is amazing as a, as a material. Look around you now, you're looking at a, a computer, it's got plastic on it. The clothing you're wearing has probably got plastic fibres in it, like polyester, if you look at the label. Uh, you've probably got a phone near you or some um, earbuds. Um, these are all made of plastic. We are surrounded by plastic carpets, paint, ceilings, everything. Um, so it's everywhere. It's very versatile. It's great. It's robust. And that's why we love it so much. And more importantly, it's cheap and it can be made very easily into any anything that we want it to, to, to um, function as. Uh, even chairs that we're sat on, for example. Uh, and just to give you kind of a global context of how much we're producing here, in 2015 alone, 322 million tonnes was produced. That's a lot of plastic. I can't even visualise that as a, as a pile of plastic uh, alone. And here in the US, we are, um, of course, a major user and uh, we are producing around 18% of the plastics in the world. So we are definitely creating a very strong plastic footprint here in the States. And because this stuff is so fantastic and looking at COVID as well, we have turned to plastic when there's been a lot of effort to maybe try and reduce our plastic footprints. We're turning to plastic because we see this as being a sterile material, which isn't necessarily true, but it's disposable. So it means it, it reduces risk of spreading COVID and that's important. Um, so we are only seeing an increasing use of plastic and production of plastic. And by the year 2050, the estimations pre Pre-COVID, uh, that this was going to triple, uh, but I believe this will increase further with the recent pandemic as well. So we're probably likely to see higher values um, increasing in the future. So what does this mean in terms of like marine plastic pollution, which is the title of my talk? Well, looking at plastic waste in particular, we know that a lot of this plastic waste that we're producing, especially for single-use plastics, like in terms of wrapping, um, food packaging, for example, which makes up a majority of uh, the plastics made each year. A lot of this is actually entering our oceans, unfortunately. And nearly 85% of the debris that we find in our oceans is plastic. So that's a huge amount. So let's explore that a little bit more. So I'm interested, before I go to my next slide, I'm gonna ask you all um, to kind of contribute to the chat now. So get ready um, to type. Um, I would like some of you to um, put into the chat um, how you think plastics are entering our oceans. So get some ideas in there. I want to see, you know, what you know about plastics and how they can end up in our oceans. And while people are thinking of ideas, we've got some more people who've uh, added to the chat here. So we've got uh, Alicia, who's looking at microplastics in the strandia. That's great. That's exciting. Um, oh, we've got some answers coming through. So great. So we've got wastewater. Absolutely. So we've got wastewater um, from our houses. So we've got beauty products. Some of you may use facial scrubs or whitening toothpaste. A lot of these will claim, contain these microscopic plastics. Washing clothes as well. If we wash our clothes with synthetic fibres in them, all these fibres are released. Hundreds of thousands of fibres are released in one six kilogram um, wash that we put um, uh, wash that we put into the washing machine. And all these products will go out from our house or apartment 
through the domestic waste to wastewater treatment centers and the processes that are uh, existing to remove particles are designed to remove large particles through um, flotation and sinking, for example. Um, but small plastics, especially microplastics, um, are far too small to be filtered out of those systems. So they end up in the ocean from these wastewater treatment centers. Um, let's see what other answers we've got here. We've got fishing lines and nets. Absolutely brilliant. Yes, this is a great point here, Paige. So um, we have um, nets or um, or uh, lines or perhaps lobster pots, for example. Um, these are typically made with um, ropes, which are made of like these synthetic materials because it's great longevity. It lasts in a very corrosive seawater environment. We want it to be strong and flexible so that we can catch our target species. And when we actually accidentally lose these in the oceans, they still function what we call ghost fishing and capturing what it is, or maybe other things we didn't intend to catch uh, originally uh, are caught in these. So these are definitely um, a contribution issue here from landfills and littering, Julian, that's a great answer. Um, sorry, Julian, uh, that's a great answer there. So we've got uh, mismanaged waste, you know, landfills. So if there isn't much protection where we put all our uh, general waste stuff could accident accidentally end up in the ocean through wind, you know, storms, for example. Uh, we have industrial waste as well from, uh, I don't know your first name, but I can see Jay Mar Market there in the name. Um, so yeah, this is absolutely right. So industry can release these um, small um, materials, um, maybe intentionally or unintentionally. Um, and we've got recreational commercial uh, shipping vessels as well. So um, when they release like the ballast water, we can have plastics coming from there as well. Uh, littering is definitely a big problem. So mismanaged waste where you maybe have a single use drinking bottle, may, um, which may be blown um, with wind from a street, for example, it's blown out of the bin, it may end up in the ocean or may have accidentally be left on the beach. Um, so yes, we've got all these great answers. So thank you everyone. These, these are absolutely brilliant and spot on. So you're very well informed on marine plastic pollution, which is great to hear. Um, so yeah, so this is kind of a, a general schematic that overviews all those fantastic points that you've got here. And the overarching issue here is that it's um, intended or unintended waste, but mostly it, well, uh, it's, it's mismanaged waste. So it's um, human society not managing their waste appropriately. Uh, and it's leading to these different pathways, uh, including rivers as well. Rivers are, are joining onto um, ocean waves. They lead to those. So any litter that goes with those rivers into the open ocean and all these other major sources that we've covered here, um, contribute to this issue. Um, other things that we perhaps don't consider very much are um, these smaller plastics, which I'll talk about um, the kind of definitions of like how we uh, define the sizes of plastics. Uh, but things like road tires, uh, sorry, tires and cars, they're rubber with like synthetic materials built in so that they're, um, they're resilient basically for their function. Uh, so we have these kind of plastic polymers built into them. So this friction is, is creating small bits of wear and tear on those tires and it ends up in the roads and these can get washed off um, with storm water. Um, and quite often places like Rhode Island, our storm water doesn't have any real processing that goes on. It just goes straight to the ocean through um, storm water uh, drain systems. So it's kind of a direct introduction. Uh, so we may have storm um, variations as well, um, where when it's very stormy, we may see more entry of plastics than we would um, uh, when there's no storms uh, coming into our oceans. So there's definitely seasonal differences here as well, which kind of complicates the kind of uh, way that we can manage our waste. <clears throat> Excuse me. So when we talk about plastics, then um, these are kind of the, the broad terms that we talk about here. Uh, it, and it's usually by the definition of their size. Um, so we have macroplastics. So this is like a, a large bottle, for example, anything that's larger than five millimeters in size is generally called a macroplastic. Um, the field of research, which I largely work uh, operate within is with microplastics. And this is, uh, these are materials which are less than five millimeters down to one micrometer in size. And then anything below that is defined as a nanoplastic. And uh, we don't know very much about these nanoplastics. We know that they can pass through um, tissues, um, organs um, in living animals and humans. Um, but because they're so challenging to work with, work with because they're so small, uh, we still have a lot to learn about nanoplastics. But I, I work within uh, the field of microplastics. So that's what we're going to have to take a stronger focus on in this talk. And we can get different types of plastics as well. Um, so here we have a picture of uh, these nurdles held in this hand. So if anyone's seen these before on the beach, maybe um, type in the chat that you've seen them. 
but these are kind of um, what we call a primary or a virgin plastic. So this is the plastic in its um, first form once it's made. Um, and does anyone know why it's made in such small kind of uh, forms like these nurdles here? Has anyone got any ideas as to why that might be um, important? Easy to melt down to form into other products. Absolutely right, Sarah. Thank you for that great response there. Yeah, so basically we want high surface area so that we can melt these plastics down into whatever it is we want to make them into. So it's a very convenient um, format. Um, so we have these kind of primary um, um, sort of virgin plastics here. And then we can also get these kind of like secondary plastics as well. Um, so a good example of this is looking at our kind of um, uh, irresponsibly um, or mismanaged uh, in terms of waste, a uh, single use drinking bottle here. And it's been in the ocean for, let's say, um, some period of time. And over time, it breaks down to create what we call secondary plastics. Uh, so this is a process that we call fragmentation. And what happens is uh, UV, UV radiation from our sun actually kind of compromises the, um, the um, structural integrity of the plastic and kind of weakens it. And then combined with the physical forces of the ocean, it will gradually break this down into smaller and smaller pieces. Um, so uh, this is yeah, a process that we call fragmentation. So we um, have this, and this can lead to uh, the production of microplastics as well. Um, so this is, uh, so there's several ways in which microplastics can be um, created in the ocean. And one of the questions that I tend to ask is, you know, what's the kind of distribution of plastics? How is this interacting with uh, animals in the marine environment? Uh, and, and when we look at um, the plastics which are floating on the surface of the water, so these are the drinking bottle that's full of air, for example, and it's got the cap on, anything that's got trap, like trapped um, air in, like polystyrene, for example, um, these can be dragged by um, wind forces at the surface of the water, but also driven by surface currents of our water. And here, uh, I'm sure any of you who have looked at plastic would have seen this seen this um, image at some point or another during your search um, in terms of looking at plastics. And here we have the global circulation of like surface waters. And what we have here is with the, um, the global winds that we have across the uh, cross winds that happen across the planet, um, these kind of create these gyres um, in terms of like when, uh, when these kind of forces collide with the direction of the water. And we kind of get these circular gyres um, created um, where I hope you can see my mouse moving here um, in, in each of these major ocean areas. And with that, all these light floating plastics are getting trapped in these areas. Um, and the Pacific um, gyres are, 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 are notoriously famous in terms of plastic pollution, because I'm sure you've probably heard about this, but we have these great Pacific garbage patches where we have this accumulation of this um, lightweight plastic litter and, and other debris as well, of course, um, co collecting to the point where people were actually um, were, were trying to uh, turn them into um, named land masses because these these areas were so extensive in terms of this like collection of debris at the surface of water of these like gyre systems. Um, but there are huge cleanup efforts now going on. Uh, but it shows that um, the these winds and and uh, ocean circulation of like surface waters can can yield great distribution of plastics from these sources that a lot of you have um, quite rightly highlighted from coastal areas broadly across the world. So it's a global issue here that we're looking at. There's wide global dispersal of these um, plastics. Uh, so it's 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 definitely a global issue that we're looking at here. But not everything always floats. With time, um, things will sink, and it also will depend on the type of plastic that we're dealing with here. So I know that there's a huge amount of international effort, including here, here in Rhode Island, where we're trying to predict where plastics are being distributed to in terms of their uh, distribution and also what, where their final fate may be, so that we can better understand about um, waste management and potentially impacts on marine animals and how that may affect stakeholders, for example. Uh, and looking at the physical characteristics of plastics, we look at density of plastics. So this is um, often expressed as grams per cubic centimetre. Uh, and anything that's lighter than seawater's density, which is around, um, let's say, roughly 1.02 grams per centimetre um, cube, sorry. Um, anything lighter than that will typically float. So you've got bottle caps, which are made of polypropylene. We've got plastic bags made of polyethylene floats, which are the polystyrene with the um, trapped air inside it. 
Um, and then anything that it has a greater density than seawater uh, is will typically sink. So we've got things like polystyrene, cellulose acetate, um, polyethylene uh, terif, uh, phthalate as well, where all the things will sink. And if there's air trapped in there, that obviously complicates the situation, but eventually when things break down, there'll be water retention and they will sink. So we can use these kind of physical characteristics to try and understand how uh, plastics are being dispersed around the world. Um, but unfortunately, it's not as simple as that. I mean, we could couple it with all the great hydrodynamical characterization we have, uh, especially here in Narragansett Bay. This is very well described, especially through the recent kind of um, uh, research efforts uh, across the state in recent years. Um, but there is a problem here where there are things that are complicating the dispersal of plastics, which, make, which is making it very, very challenging to um, accurately predict where they're going. Uh, and, this is a, 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 and this is largely down to biofouling. So looking at the plastic cup here, uh, anyone, uh, some of you may have experienced this in the past, with if, if you um, regularly dive or, and don't wash your um, face mask or, or whatever, um, you'll see that there's some gunge kind of appears or a biofilm appears on, on, on equipment um, after it's been exposed for a while to seawater. So this is what we call biofouling. And when we get biofouling on plastics and water, well, firstly, it's very hard to, we, we still don't really know very well about um, how much biofouling occurs on different types of plastics. So there's a huge information gap there. Um, but what we do know is that when biofouling occurs on the plastics, it actually increases the density of the plastic meaning it's going to sink faster through, through the water uh, down to the seabed. So this complicates um, predictions because this very much depends on the biological activity of coastal regions, and this has huge uh, variation across uh, our global oceans and coastal areas. Uh, so people are looking into this, and when we look at things like turbulence, um, some people, some areas may have intermittent disturbances, which are not um, uh, 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 may not occur on a regular basis. All of these things can really complicate this story. Um, but what we do know is that the eventual fate of many plastics is eventually to sink to the seabed. And if you're a poor organism that lives on the seabed, this is potentially going to be problematic because you're going to be facing the noise. Um, eventually for many of these plastics. And one of the other issues that we know is that, um, is that the plastic pollution is a long-term pollution issue. Why? Because plastic is so good. It has incredible longevity. It's built to last. So, uh, so we have to ask ourselves, you know, how long does it take for these uh, materials to break down in the water? Uh, so we've got some examples here. So we've got a plastic bottle. So that takes around 450 years. 450 years, you know, that's, that's beyond our lifetime, but that's a long-term issue here. Um, we also have fishing line. Fishing line is incredible. You know, it's, it's designed to be stretchy. It's de designed to be robust so you can get, you know, catch that um, sport fish that you're, you're looking for. Um, but if, if we have accidental loss to the ocean, we're looking at several hundred years for this to break down. So this is a very... A problematic issue here, a long-term issue. Um, and when we think about other, um, other environmental issues such as climate change, we know that plastics are also going to be present with this. So it's something that researchers are now trying to couple together because they realize that there are two long-term environmental issues happening uh, simultaneously, uh, which is presenting challenges for our um, very delicate and valuable marine ecosystems. So this is where my research Kind of comes in is really understanding about uh, trying well trying to better understand how marine animals in our oceans are being impacted by these plastics um, because we still don't have a huge amount of information on this because we know everywhere that we've sampled so far in the globe we have found plastics especially microplastics they're everywhere they're in Antarctica uh, they're in they're here in Narragansett Bay um, they're everywhere. Um, even like the kind of areas that we would class as pristine and isolated plastics have reached those areas because they're so well dispersed um, through um, water um, hydrodynamics and the characteristics of these plastics themselves. So when we look at the, when we consider how marine animals are being impacted by plastics, there's kind of like two uh, main um, areas here that we, that we do understand. So first of all, there is kind of this physical impact so many of you would have seen these horrifying images of entanglement of animals with plastics 
Um, but we also know that animals will, will unintentionally ingest plastics as well because they can't differentiate them from these from their uh, regular food supplies. Uh, and these can lead to blockages along the digestive tract or at least um, create physical damage. We know that some animals are able to ingest um, these smaller microplastic particles, but some are, some are still retained along the digestive tract. So it could be creating some physical damage there. And there's also some potential risk of chemical impacts here. And this is something that people don't tend to realize as much. So let's think about our everyday kind of like functional plastics that we create as human beings. Some of these plastics are built with chemicals that make them resilient to heat, make them, um, especially with the pandemic, they're resilient to bacteria. So these kind of these antibacterial chemical properties in them as well. Um, those in itself in themselves can actually create a risk of chemical exposure to the animals that interact um, and maybe ingest those plastics. So there is that uh, risk too. Um, but also um, plastics are pretty good at um, aggregating persistent organic pollutants um, or even maybe pathogens to their surfaces when they're in the marine environment. So we also have this kind of toxicity and also kind of disease um, potential exposure as well through these plastics. So um, overall, we you know plastics really are presenting quite a problem and concern um, to our viable marine ecosystems. Um, so I'm going to put up a bit of a warning here. Anyone who uh, um, doesn't really want to see um, a kind of distressing image of an animal being entangled with some fishing line, look away now, uh, but it's important that we do see this. Um, so here is a picture of a seal that has fishing line, a bit of a fishing net that's been wrapped around its neck and dug in. This is a very common thing to see. Um, I've also, we, there's also been increasing reports of frisbees that we use in the beach, with, which is just a, um, a, like a hollow kind of loop. Um, seal, baby seals will play with these and then they'll end up flipping onto their necks and they, they're stuck there and they end up growing with these um, frisbees digging into their uh, into the underlying tissue of their necks. So, you know, this is a kind of a, a very um, emotional um, picture to use because it, it elicits a response from um, yourselves, such as the viewers, to realise, you know, how impactful plastics can be on our viable marine ecosystems. Uh, here I have this um, other image. Can anyone hazard a guess to what this has come from? Or what, what the situation might be? So I'm, I'm kind of looking at the surf students in particular here to give me some, some ideas of what they think this might be. So I think people are perhaps a little bit unsure. Um, so um, this is basically the stomach contents of a sperm whale that was washed up onto the coast of Scotland. Um, yes, thank you, Matthew Rock. Yes, it's from the digestive tract of the sperm whale. Um, so looking at this, we have, we've got fishing nets, we've got fishing ropes, and we know that these are made with um, synthetic fiber materials. They're, they're built to be uh, long lasting in the water, and they've obviously been lost at sea. Uh, and the whale has, has um, misidentified this as a food and ingested it. And the autopsy um, from the vet on this particular whale um, resulted in the um, conclusion that this whale had died from the ingestion of these um, uh, synthetic fiber ropes and materials. Uh, and we are seeing more of this in um, autopsies of these uh, large uh, whales unfortunately. So this is a, a real kind of like extreme example of ingestion um, and having problems with, with uh, vulnerable marine communities. So we see this with large animals, but what about the smaller animals that we have in our um, incredible oceans? Um, so here are some pathways where we have um, fish. Fish come in all sorts of uh, shapes and sizes through the water and near the surface, all the way through the um, depth of the water, even to the seabed where we, we find fish everywhere. Uh, and we have seen fish, fish that have been dissected so far across the world have been found to contain uh, microplastics. And in many cases, um, especially I had a student in the UK who was dissecting some uh, viable fisheries um, samples in the, um, in the Irish Sea. Uh, and we found that roughly 80% of what was found in terms of microplastics in the fish was made of fibres. So this is fibres coming from clothing, for example. Uh, and this is a kind of regular feature that we're seeing. So the fish are ingesting water. Uh, and they need this um, not only to, uh, they need it to breathe, so they need to um, ingest water and then pass the water through their gills for gaseous exchange. 
Um, so they have to uh, inhale water uh, basically continuously to be able to, 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 to breathe. Uh, so there's a risk of exposure there of um, ingesting plastics. Uh, and also, of course, through feeding. So there's misidentification of plastics and interpreting it as food, uh, especially when there's biofilms on the plastics. Um, if there's any animals that have any kind of chemical detection for foods, um, then biofilms can actually disguise the plastics um, to make the animals think that they may be food sources. Uh, and this has been shown in research. Uh, and so they can be ingested and then passed through the digestive tract. So the, just from this like very basic schematic, you can see there are plenty of opportunities for a plastic to perhaps get stuck um, in this kind of convoluted um, channel that it has to pass through. And then I guess one uh, particular group of animals that's been a, a major concern and interest to researchers is also looking at filter feeders. So these are um, things like oysters and mussels, which will um, draw in um, huge amounts of seawater each day. So we're looking at somewhere between 56 to 190 litres per day of water. And um, what they're doing is they're basically filtering out all these delicious uh, phytoplankton particles. But of course, what comes with that are also microplastics. Uh, and then exhaling the water after extracting this food and, and uh, by accumulating it in its stomach uh, to um, digest all those delicious microalgae that they've collected. Um, we do, do know that oysters and mussels are able to eject um, some types of microplastics as well. So there is some like, um, uh, like through full, full way through the digestive system processing that can happen. Um, but we still, but we do see that there are plastics that do remain in, in the in the gut of these animals, uh, to the extent where um, a study that's been done by Rockman et al, um, where they collected um, samples of seafood um, across the U.S. from markets and supermarkets, uh, and they've uh, and this was like um, oysters and this was fish as well, and they found that uh, this is a, a kind of very crude presentation here, but it's really to emphasise what they found and 80% of what they found inside animals uh, was fibers. They also found some molar filament, foam and small fragments. But what this highlights is that these animals do contain microplastics when they are entering the, the food chain. And we know very little about how this is impacting human health, if at all. Uh, so this is, again, this is another major knowledge gap. So we're trying to understand, you know, what are the links here uh, um, uh, to determine whether there are any interventions needed. So microplastics are everywhere and pretty much in everything, which is very depressing. So one problem, though, is that when we think about microplastics, we may perhaps think this is all doom and gloom. And I'm talking about microplastics specific here rather than these like larger plastics um, like we found in the whale's stomach, for example. So with microplastics, we still have a lot to learn. Um, and much of the research that's been looking at microplastics, especially in the laboratory context where they can control the conditions to understand um, how plastics may be affecting animals, there seems to be a very strong doom and gloom perspective going on. And by that, I mean, we're seeing really awful responses. You know, animals are not responding well to uh, ingesting or being exposed to microplastics in the lab context. Uh, but there's something that should be considered here uh, is the approach that people have been taking. So uh, there's a really nice short article that I would direct our um, great SES students to read, which is basically uh, from Lenz, who talks about how microplastic exposure studies should uh, be more environmentally realistic. Uh, so what they basically are, are highlighting is that in many of these lab studies, they're actually using very, very high concentrations of microplastics, um, which we would never see in the marine environment ever uh, to elicit a response in these animals. Now, this is important because we still we need this kind of approach so that we can understand how animals might be interacting so we can direct our research um, efforts. We have to kind of start from somewhere. Um, but using these really high concentrations also creates a, 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 an issue for waste management um, organizations because there's a mismatch in terms of like what we know about extreme exposure uh, and, and what is actually happening in terms of exposure in the ocean, which is much, much lower concentrations. And because of that, we still have an extremely limited understanding about how microplastics are impacting marine animals. Um, so there is a huge amount of effort, and I know there's a lot of effort even happening here in Rhode Island to try and address this uh, major knowledge gap here. Um, and also, there's been a lot of strong focus from researchers looking at um, particular species like filter feeders because of their um, bioaccumulation um, efforts of, of uh, food particles from the water. Um, so we also need to 
figure out how other um, economically and ecologically important animals are being impacted as well by these environmentally relevant um, concentrations of microplastics that we find in the ocean. And that's something that I definitely do in my research and I'll be talking to you about um, now. So before I move on to that, has anyone got any questions so far? I can see um, uh, we've got a great comment here. The Great Pacific Garbage Patch covers an approximate surface area of 1.6 million square kilometres. Absolutely, yes. An area twice the size of Texas and three times the size of France. So yes, these, these um, garbage patches were, are, are incredibly huge. Uh, and I think this is what led to the basis of trying to recognise it as some sort of like land mass uh, for sure. So thank you for that fantastic point there. Oh, so I'm curious about the impacts of fish gills. Um, good question. Um, we don't know. Um, it's we just know that, that there's a, a potential pathway for for uh, microplastics to interact with the animal. A lot of people focus, focused on ingestion, but for the gills, um, we still don't know. So I'm sorry, I can't answer your question comprehensively there. So as Jim said, I like to focus on sea urchins. They're great animals to work with. They're ecologically important. They kind of dictate what grows in a given area of the of the seabed. And they're also economically um, very important as well. So if you were to cut inside an urchin, you'll find this five-armed bright orange edible row, or uni as it's called. You can have it as sushi or pasta, it's delicious. We serve it here in Rhode Island. Try it, it's definitely a, a unique taste to it. Uh, has anyone tried sea urchin out of interest? So Jim's tried it, excellent. That doesn't surprise me because I know that you studied them. Um, they, but yes, they, 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 they're delicious. They're a luxurious food item. Uh, and another area of my research is trying to um, increase urchin agriculture across New England. Um, so ecologically and, and economically, they're uh, very important animals. Um, and they also live in the seabed. So they're at this interface where we're seeing a lot of this accumulation of plastic happening. Um, and especially from an ingestion point of view. So let's look at how a sea urchin is built, first of all. So um, we have these, um, let's see. Yeah, so on the underside of this animal, it's like this round animal, on the underside we have its mouth, um, which from the side looks like this. So this part is inside the animal. And what we can see on the bottom side here is its mouth. We've got these five teeth. This is called the Aristotle's lantern. And what they do is they basically scrape and pull up any material it brings from the seabed um, so that it can digest the food. And I've got a video which shows that slightly. Here we go, just to show that in action. Sorry about the sound. But yeah, you can see the teeth now closing and drawing up into the mouth and repeating that process. So that's how a, a sea urchin feeds on the seabed. Uh, and Another thing we don't really know is about how short-term st um, storm, storms can um, impact microplastic resuspension um, and how that might impact animals. Uh, so these are some things I've been looking at um, using sea urchins. And another reason um, that we would want to look at the storm, storm resuspension is because of how sea urchins are made. So on the top part of its body, we have these kind of like little plates. So this is its anus here. And this one particular plate we're interested in is called the madreporit. And up closer, you can see it's got this very porous um, kind of disc here. And what that is, is it's acting like a, like a kitchen sieve. It's drawing seawater through this sieve into the body of the sea urchin. And what that urchin is doing is it's pressurizing that water to be able to move its tube feet uh, and other body parts. So it's kind of this pressurized water vascular system that we call. Uh, so I was interested to know whether this gets blocked up from the presence of microplastics, which are suspended um, from, um, from sediments and storms. And we also know that they're very well equipped to remove materials off their bodies uh, using these microscopic pedicellariae, um, kind of uh, tri-armed, um, kind of, I guess you'd call them an arm. They kind of like um, snap and manipulate and hold particles and um, move them off the body. Um, working very hard. So if, if these are working harder, we might see, being this, see this being translated through metabolic rate of the animal because they're having to work much harder and increasing their um, energy needs. So what I did was I kind of created a mock um, resuspension event in the laboratory. So this was with, um, with a collaborator of mine, Joelle Richard, who was based in the Florida Gulf, uh, Gulf Coast University. And we used the Atlantic purple urchin, or 
Arbacea punctulata. And we exposed it to these um, polyst polystyrene nine micrometer spheres um, at around 25,000 particles per liter. So this is kind of the resuspension event. And this is based on um, concentrations that we found reported in Canadian um, seabed values where they found around 25,000 um, particles of microplastics in surface sediments. So we're kind of basing this off a kind of number, but this is all hypothetical in the sense that we're simulating the lab here. Uh, and we exposed these animals um, for, I think it was a couple of weeks uh, to see, not a couple of weeks, a couple of days, sorry, like a short-term storm event to see how this would impact the metabolic rate, which we have here. And we also wanted to see how altered salinity might um, enhance this as well, because uh, if we have increased precipitation like rain, we're going to see lowered salinity as well. Uh, and that may impact how well um, the marjoporic and the water vascular system is, is being impacted. But it's a very kind of short message that we got from, from this study. Um, we didn't see any impacts um, of, of, of uh, this resuspension event or these altered salinity environments to this uh, sea urchin. So it shows that they're very robust to these short term environments. And I didn't see any evidence of the marjoporic being blocked either. So we use these fluorescent microbeads, which you can see in this picture here. Um, and I used this to look at whether they were trapped in this marjoporic, and there was no evidence of that. Um, so we believe that um, cilia, which are on the surface of these um, marjoporic um, pores, were able to kind of move out the, the particles away from uh, to protect the urchin, uh, to allow it to continue to function. Um, but this was the first study to show that we did see evidence of ingestion um, of plastics in these animals because um, some particles uh, which occurred near the, the, even though they were well suspended in this, um, in this tank system, um, the urchins were still able to ingest a few that they found at the bottom of the tank there. So that led me to my next, in, my next sort of question of interest here. So what happens when animals are actually ingesting plastic, especially sea urchins, because we don't, we, we knew hardly anything about these animals. There's been very little interest in, in focusing on this um, particular animal for microplastic research. Um, so what I did was uh, I went back to Europe at this point and looked at European species. Uh, so here we have the European green sea urchin, some kinds of the yellowis, and we have the European common sea urchin, Paracentrius libidus. Um, they're both kind of commercially interesting and ecologically important. Um, and I wanted to see whether they responded in similar ways to these resuspension events, but also I wanted to see how they would respond if we were to make an artificial diet but put in microplastics to see whether that would create any um, problems for, for their kind of animal condition. And having these two species then also gave us the, um, the, the kind of tool that we would need to understand whether species were responding to these um, situations differently or not, because uh, that would mean we, we may or may not be able to generalize um, responses in relation to uh, waste management strategies of plastics. Now, something that I want to point out with these two species, though, is that they have slightly different feeding strategies. OK, so they both still have this Aristotle's lantern that they use to feed um, from the seabed, um, but their diet is slightly different. So they're strongly what we call omnivorous. So what that means is they they generally feed on um, small animal matter and plant matter, so algae. And some are some more um, omnivorous than others. So the European green sea urchin here, I've got this kind of like schematic where these uh, it, uh, it's omnivorous where it feeds on um, a lot of animal uh, materials, so things like tube worms, and they have these like small calcareous, like hard um, tubes. And they also uh, will feed on small um, shelled animals as well. And we know this because there's, there's decades, uh, or even, even like maybe over 100 years worth of um, records where urchins have these hard shells found in their di digestive um, tract. So we know that they ingest these regular, uh, regularly as part of their dietary intake, these hard parts as part of their diet, as well as these soft algal food, uh, al algae food items. So it means that they're used to using, uh, ingesting hard parts. So their sensitivity to microplastics, which are also hard and, and abrasive, but potentially to the digestive tract, um, may, may be less of an issue because they're used to it. Um, so I was interested to compare it to this European common sea urchin because this it has a much stronger herbivorous diet. So it feeds largely um, on these soft algae components and has less experience with ingesting these hard components. Um, with the with the kind of hypothesis that this um, herbivorous species is probably going to be um, more sensitive to the ingestion of microplastics. 
so I, I appreciate time's moving on so we'll be finishing soon um so we did uh, the same external exposure that I mentioned before where we had these polystyrene beads on the outside of the animals to see how they responded in terms of their metabolic rate uh, and I also made up this artificial diet in a separate group of animals where we um, added 0.5% mass of microplastics um, but this time we're using PVC particles uh, so we're using something that's um, regularly occurring in sediments um, and in a slightly sort of larger size fraction here and we fed them for two months in this diet and we looked at how um, how growth survival and how um, their um, the edible tissue and also how their reproductive um, kind of stages were impacted as well. So the, for the external exposure uh, to to summarize there were no significant differences so they, they were again this confirms that they're very able to remove these particles to uh, protect uh, the margin for it. Uh, and remove particles and it makes sense you see urchins in the field and they have uh, often um, won't have very much debris on them apart from shells which they use for protection against light or predation um, but for ingestion we found something interesting um, so in terms of like most things uh, when were not impacted uh, in terms of the gonad color the index the the the, the size of the gonad tissue or the reproductive state or the growth so it shows that they're fairly resilient to ingesting plastics um, but one area that showed some um, significant differences was the alimentary index. So what that is, is the um, gut tissue relative to the whole mass of the animal. So the gut tissue can actually tell you a lot about the status, um, nutritional status of the animal. They can actually use the gut wall as a secondary site for um, nutrient storage. So if that's kind of compromised, that indicates that there may be something going on um, which is detrimental to the animal's um, nutritional status and health. And what we found was uh, aligning with our hypothesis was that uh, our green sea urchin, which is omnivorous, uh, was very resilient to the ingestion of plastics, but our more um, herbivorous uh, sea urchin here was more sensitive and it showed a significant reduction in the alimentary index here. So this means that this um, animal, which does not regularly ingest hard parts, is more vulnerable and sensitive to these microplastics. And it also highlights that there is species uh, specific responses to microplastics, so it makes it hard to generalize these responses. And it also highlights something interesting here where um, we could be we could look at this as uh, the the um, dietary. Um, the what's the word the dietary habit of the animals could act as a sensitivity indicator for sensitivity towards macroplastics as well this does need to be confirmed with more studies but i thought this was an interesting um, outcome from this from this trial so i'm kind of looking at repeating this with other species here to see if we can get um uh, if we can get some repeatable results so that's some like recent research but what's happening now we've got a lot of exciting projects happening here in rhode island um, and here in URI specifically, we've got these are just some examples of the projects that are happening now. Uh, the big one that we have is with Rhode Island Sea Grant. We're looking at whether environmentally relevant uh, concentrations of plastics and using fibers specifically because fibers make up 35% of what we find in the ocean. And we already know that those are commonly occurring in marine animals that we encounter when we sample. Uh, and we're actually looking at whether these persistent organic pollutants um, are actually and diseases such as Vibrio. Um, whether there are interactions with the plastics and whether the, the plastics uh, fibers are acting as vectors for these as transport to food webs. So we're looking at um, oysters and we're looking at these blue crabs as well and looking at whether there's um, transfer across the food chain as well to see if we can see uh, biomagnification or transfer at least uh, so we can better understand what the situation is here for Narragansett Bay. And um, we're also looking at looking at spatial and temporal distribution of microplastics across the bay. In fact, right now, there are some surf students in our team and our research team out in the bay sampling plastics as we speak. Um, and I can show you a photo of them in a minute. minute. So here we have a, um, a web page which we developed as part of this project. Um, so feel free to, to look this up. This is um, aussiemap.org. Uh, so it's the Ocean State Initiative for Marine Plastics, um, co-funded by Sea Grant and Rhode Island uh, Science and Technology Advisory Council. We've got all, we're putting updates on our project there. We're gonna be putting data up there as we get it. Obviously the pandemic has put a little bit of delay in the works for us getting our data, but we're, we're, we're back on back on the field sam uh, sampling now which is great uh, to catch up with that 
Um, so we're, we're putting all our information there and all our team. So please take a look at that if you want to learn more about what we're doing and the tools we're using. But here we've got our steel pump that we're using to collect large volumes of seawater down to 10 micrometers um, size fractional microplastics, uh, which is fairly unusual. A lot of people will work to 300 micrometers because it's much more easier to work with. Um, here's the plastics team, or, or, or a few of them at least. Um, so my colleague here, and Andrew, uh, Andrew Davies in biological sciences, um, he and I uh, ha have come over from the UK and uh, we, where we worked there together and we're also working here on plastics as well. Uh, so he's a, an ecologist and he does a lot of the kind of field sampling side of the plastics while I'm more about the lab work and the um, ecophysiology eco work. We have uh, Brian, who's our postdoc, and we've had a huge amount of undergraduates work with our projects. Uh, and we've got Roy Minna, Dean, and Hannah Haskell, who are graduate students in our team, who are um, doing a lot of the work that we've mentioned um, in terms of the oysters and the crabs and, and collecting samples from the bay. And we've got a, a list of our um, multidisciplinary team here. Um, I'll, I, I'll not go through the whole list because of, of time constraints, um, but there is a lot of people involved in a, in a very strongly multidisciplinary topic. And then literally, this is a picture I got about an hour ago from the team, so they are on the boat. And we have uh, Morgan McCutcheon and, and Janelle Mercer, who are our surf, a couple of our surf students in the team. So here um, we're wearing these fabulous, fashionable orange um, cotton jumpsuits uh, because we need to be able to trace contamination from, from our clothing. And it's, it's a color that we don't see often in our samples. So it means it's going to be very vibrant in terms of what we, what we see in our filter papers when we extract the microplastics in the lab. So it's all about reducing contamination and controlling for it and accounting for it. And that is actually 50% of the hard work of extracting microplastics from the bay um, yeah, and from marine animals. So it's extremely challenging. So if you, you're our students who, are, who may be in this talk today, um, I do have a marine plastic pollution course that I run every spring. Uh, and this is a, a, a really fun course. We look at sources and distribution of plastics. We look at in more detail the impacts it has on marine animals. Uh, more importantly, what makes it very unique is that students are actually, um, are actually going to practice extracting and identifying plastics, um, not only from the beach, so macroplastics, but also microplastics from, from beach sediments. Uh, uh, and process, process them through the lab. Um, and the reason is because there's a lot of people who don't have this experience and there are many, many challenges such as contamination um, and variable techniques being used across the world. So I want to make sure that students are well prepared for an increasing job market in the field of microplastics. Um, and also we think about um, human um, ethics and perspectives and we look at solutions and alternative products as well we think about um, different perspectives of plastic issues so when we're making choices about products we're buying we kind of become more informed about what the consequences of those might be in terms of the environment but also of vulnerable communities of people uh, which are being affected by the plastics industry so if you're interested in learning more about that please reach out to me and more importantly there are no exams yes um, but we have a lot of great um, tools like you develop standard operating procedures you actually are writing something that you can take to employment so it's something i'm thinking about your employability and having something that you can um, use in the future and again i'm sorry this is all focused on your eye students but i am recruiting uh, for research credit uh, students for the full semester to do beach litter surveys. So we're doing um, scientific beach litter surveys across Rhode Island and generating data towards scientific research. Places are filling quickly, so please get in touch with me if you're interested in getting involved with this. And I'm going to say thank you very much. I'm sorry I went slightly over, but has anyone got any questions that they would like to ask? And thanks for being such a great engaging crowd. You've been fantastic.